Mike Anderson is a retired Rockwell engineer who completed his master gardening training at Lynn County in 2006. He's a regular at Lynn County Winter Gardening Fair and at public libraries throughout the area. Mike's presentations are among my favorites, and when he presents, I'm usually in the audience. His topics include outstanding trees of the Midwest, ash tree alternatives, outstanding shrubs for the Midwest garden, and gardening with color. This year, he presented Create a Toad House. Mike has also led tree walkabouts at Bruce Moore. He's been a member of the Lynn County Extension Council since 2015. Today, Mike is presenting What's Wrong With My Tree? Learning to correctly diagnose a tree problem is an important first step in saving an unhealthy tree or determining when a tree becomes a hazard and has to be removed. His, syst his systemic approach to examining trees highlights the environmental, bacterial, and insect-related tree issues to discover possible problems and solutions. Please welcome Mike. Uh, th thank you, Linda. Uh, as Linda mentioned, I have been a master gardener since 2006, and up until the pandemic, I've worked the Hort Line at least once a week since that time. And some of the most common questions that we get are, what's wrong with my tree? <laughs> so in 2020, for the, our Winter Garden Fair, I put, to, put together this presentation that covers most of the questions that we receive during the, the growing year on trees. By the way, you know what the other two most common questions are? What kind of a bug is this and how do I kill it? <laughs> what kind of a weed is this and how do I kill it? So, so trees are a valuable in source, uh, resource and uh, important to our environment. And you know, a, a, a mature tree in your front yard can increase your property value by as much as $10,000. So it's important to diagnose problems early so that you can avoid having to call Joe in to take your tree down like this picture here. It's also important that if you do discover that there's something wrong with your tree to get it out of the, the uh, environment before it becomes a hazard. So these are some factors causing unhealthy trees. Probably the first, and they're in order of importance, the environmental stress. That's probably represents 50 to 60% of the problems with trees. That's drought, uh, flood, wind storms, that type of thing. Site problems are the next most important. That's planting the wrong tree in the wrong place. Uh, planting a tree too close to a structure so that in 20 years it has to be taken down, that type of thing. Third, mo third most common is animal in injury. And then you think of diseases and, and in, uh, insects being a, a common problem with trees. Really, that represents about 10 to 15 percent of, of tree issues. So, so when you're diagnosing a tree problem, it's, it's, first of all, it's important to understand what the parts of the tree are. Basically, you've got three parts, the roots, the trunk, and the canopy. So if any one of these parts are not functioning properly, you're gonna see the tree decline and probably eventually die. So the roots are responsible for absorbing nutrients, water, and oxygen. That's transported up through the trunk and the branches to the canopy, which is the leaves or the needles. And then the uh, leaves or needles absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, combine that with the nutrients they've gotten from the roots, and uh, through sunlight, photosynthesis is, is accomplished, which produces glucose that feeds the rest of the tree. So again, as I say, any, if any one of these parts is malfunctioning, it can cause a decline in the tree. So I'm going to take a systematic approach to diagnosing tree problems. First, we're going to look at the leaves or the canopy. Then we're going to look at the trunk and the branches. And then we're going to examine the roots. So look at the foliage first, <clears throat> looking for possible insect infestations, diseases, which can be either fungal or bacterial, or stress. And uh, that's 
lack of one or more of the key elements required for photosynthesis, light, water, or nutrients. So first of all, do the leaves have holes or ragged edges? Or are there needles missing? Well, you've probably got a chewing insect. Remember Don Lewis's class? You got chewing insects and sucking insects. So first we're gonna go over chewing insects. The common ones here are grasshoppers, beetles, <coughs> sawflies, and caterpillars. So about the second week in May, we start getting calls. What's this ugly black worm that's on my mugle pine? Uh, it's a sawfly. It's a, uh, a wasp. So they lay their eggs on the mugle pine in the fall. They overwinter. And then in the spring, the uh, larva of the sawfly starts emerging. They start eating all the needles on the mugle pine. Now, it's a real problem with mugle pines because uh, for, for pines, you know, to keep that pin cushiony look of a mugle pine, you clip off the candles about the 1st of June. And so most of what's in, in the plant are the needles from previous years. Well, if the uh, uh, sawfly larva eat all those needles, it's going to make a, a, a nude branch and really make an ugly looking plant. So it's important to get rid of these as soon as you start seeing them. And you can use insecticides. That's what my wife always used to like to use. She would spray them with seven about the first of May, and that take care of the problem. Uh, I used to just pick them off if there aren't too many, but I found a, a good strong hose is really effective. You can uh, squirt them all off. When they fall on the ground, they're not programmed to climb back up on the branch. They'll just um, wither and die. So, well, it turns out there's about 4,000 different species of this sawfly. For just about every woody plant that is evolved, an associated sawfly has evolved with it. So here's a couple examples. You see the maple leaf sawfly is totally different than what I showed you on the mugo pine because these have evolved with the maple leaf to be camouflaged with the, with the leaf. Same with the gooseberry example. Other chewing insects are uh, bugs, the caterpillar, grasshopper. I understand that that catalpa uh, caterpillar makes good fishing bait, I don't know. Any fishermen here? Yeah. <laughs> you know, as a kid growing up in the 50s, about August, there would be just swarms of grasshoppers everywhere. And I just don't see those anymore. I don't, I, what, what's happened to them? But. And then our favorite, the Japanese beetle. Have, have you got this in, in Iowa City? I know we got it in Cedar Rapids about 10, 15 years ago. And when I was giving a talk at the Winter Garden Fair, the people from Iowa City hadn't gotten it yet. Anyway, this arrived in the country about uh, 1916, it was first discovered in New Jersey, and by 2015, it had gotten over all of the United States except for about nine western states. So it has slowly progressed across the country. Now back in the 40s and the 50s, major cities like Chicago dumped tons and tons of DDT into the environment trying to kill this guy, and all they accomplished was killing good insects, and a few songbirds to the point where DDT was finally banned uh, use in, uh, in the 70s. So, so how do you get rid of it? Well, one method is planting disease or plant resistant varieties. I know there's a few crab apples that uh, the Japanese beetle don't attack. I've had good luck with the Donald Lyman crab apple, prairie fire crab apple. I know a lot of the older varieties, they just get denuded from the Japanese beetle about the end of the summer. You can do nothing. In most cases, the damage really isn't all that uh, severe. You can use garden fabrics. That probably doesn't work on a large tree. Maybe a small shrub would work on that. You can use traps. That's not really recommended. Uh, there's something satisfying about taking a about a thousand dead Japanese beetles out to the trash every night, but you're probably attracting more beetles into your yard than if you didn't use the traps at all. 
You can use insecticides at the first sign of uh, infestation. There's grub control. The idea there is that you kill the Japanese beetle while it's still in the larva stage before it becomes a beetle. Uh, I don't think that's very effective either. You're going to kill the grubs in your yard, but how about your neighbor's yard or the neighbor down the street? You know, when a Japanese beetle wakes up in the morning, it can travel as much as a, a mile before it finds its first meal. So uh, you can use tree injections or insecticidal soil, soil drenches. I know that's a, a popular thing. I think Bayer makes a product that they uh, sell in the big box stores and, and the nurseries. So. Let me go over the, uh, some of the insecticides in order of toxic, toxicity. Probably the least toxic of all of the insecticides is neem oil. It's a natural product com that comes from the neem tree. The neem tree goes, grows natural in, in India. You can use insecticidal soaps. You know, insects breathe through their, their uh, skin. So an insecticidal soap clogs up their uh, breathing mechanisms so they suffocate. Problem with that is, that, again, it's not going to work on a large tree because you have to uh, contact the, uh, the beetle. There's carbon mates. Uh, seven is an example of that. That's an insecticide. Or you can use a nu what I call the nuclear option. It's anything that includes this chemical imidacloprid. Um, Uh, it's applied to a tree or a shrub either with an injection or a soil trench. And that's absorbed into the, the tree or shrub, and every cell in that tree and shrub actually becomes a poison stick. So any animal or bug that ingests any, any part of that tree or shrub will die instantly. And that's why I call it the nuclear option. I wouldn't be surprised if eventually this isn't banned too like DDT. It's really a very, very lethal product. So we talked about biting insects. These are the, or chewing insects. These are the sucking insects. Scales, aphids, mealybugs, whiteflies, trips, and mites. You know you've got one of the, well, this is a picture of a scale. And the aphids are really, really small. You almost need a microscope to see them. And they'll be on the under, underside of the leaf. And what, what makes them a problem is they suck the, the, the juice right out of the leaves, which probably doesn't kill the tree. Um, it does make a mess. If, if uh, I know in Chicago, we had four um, maple trees in the uh, in the front yard, and they were all infected by scale. And that when they, they suck the juice out of the, the leaves, it's actually uh, bug poop, which forms this, what they call honeydew, which is a, a sticky substance that gets on the ground and all over, over everything. If you park your car under one of these trees that's got scale on it, the next morning you'll find a real thin film of this uh, uh, sticky substance on it. So it's more of a mess than a, it is really a deterrent to the tree. So anyway, control. You can wipe the leaves off with the mild solution of just soap. Again, that probably only works on a small tree or a, or a bush. You can hose it off every couple days with a hose. Again, it probably doesn't work on a large tree. It, the trees I had in Chicago were uh, probably 50 feet tall all, and none, none of these would have worked on that. Neem oil, again, that, that only works on smaller things. Insecticidal soap or uh, something like seven or eight. Or you can use a nuclear option. Are there bumps on the leaves? We always, about the middle of the summer, we always get somebody bringing these leaves in with these ugly bumps on the leaves. And what they are is uh, spider mites that have laid their eggs in the leaf. And to counteract that, the uh, tree forms this uh, chamber around the, the, uh, the eggs and makes, makes these bumps. Uh, really doesn't hurt the tree. It uh, looks worse than it is. And quite often, within about a month, these are, disappear completely. Are there spots of partial discoloration or blisters present? 
The two pictures on the left are anthracnose. It, it's a, a fungus, and it's very common here in Iowa, especially if we have a wet, uh, cool spring. Um, the one in the upper middle, that's rhizos rhizospheral <coughs> needle cast, very common with blue spruce. Um, and then apple rust, that's a, a symbiotic uh, fungal disease that travels between um, help me out here Jun junipers and the fruit trees <clears throat> and then the two on the far left are wilt disease and those are typically uh, transported by uh, a beetle of some kind that um, it carries the disease and uh, open wounds on trees or sap on the trees attract it and when it goes to uh, munch on the sap it carries the disease with it that's uh, the oaks are a very common uh, one that has this disease and that's why we recommend don't prune oak trees except in uh, when they're completely dormant to prevent having this disease both of these are diseases are fatal to the tree so if they get it you're, you're going to lose the tree and that brings up uh, about pruning again just there are so many diseases that, that are transported from the to the sap of the tree for, on an open wound that the best time to prune is during the dormant season and that's the only good time to prune so a little bit about uh, some of the fungal diseases anthracnose is a, is a common one uh, as I said the spores are present everywhere and they get infected in the leaves and then they they grow colonies on the leaves and those leaves fall off in the fall and they they're embedded in all the leaves on the ground and then the next spring uh, the wind kicks those leaves up throws those speed spores back up in the atmosphere where you get animals like squirrels running through the the leaves and then climbing up in the trees so those spores are everywhere uh, the reason that uh, they seem to be more common in wet, uh, cool springs is that those spores, if they hit a wet leaf, they're going to attach themselves and they're going to be able to grow then. A dry leaf, it's not so much. So when you have a wet spring, it's when we see this disease more prevalent. So the, the cures for it are basically to, to try and clean up the uh, debris every fall so to get rid of as many of those spores as possible. Uh, Another thing is just plant resistant varieties. There are several varieties that are resistant to some of these diseases. Like I know there are several crab apples that are uh, resistant to the uh, uh, rust disease, fire blight disease, um, or you can apply a fungicide. Now, for deciduous trees, it probably doesn't make much difference because those leaves, the infected leaves, are going to fall off and they're going to go away. It's more important for conifers because those needles stay on there year after year after year. So once infected, they're going to stay on the tree forever. Well, not forever, but for several years. So that gets into the rhizospheral needle cast disease. That's common on our blue spruces. I don't know why we think that we should grow blue spruces in Iowa. They're native to Colorado, not Iowa. The, the summers here are just too hot and humid for blue spruce to survive. But the rhizospheral needle cast fungus is in the ground everywhere. And so when you plant a blue spruce, first time it rains, it's going to splash those spores up onto the tree. And once attached, and if they start growing, it's going to start affecting the bottom needles or branches, and then eventually work its way up the tree. So there is a cure for it. You can use this fungicide, it's a Bordeaux mixture and you put it on sometime during the last two weeks in May and then reapply it in uh, four to six weeks. Are the leaves deformed or cupped? This is a good example of uh, uh, being hit with a, a chemical of some kind and it's, there's not much you can do with this. Maybe if, if it has just happened you can go out with the hose and try and wash the leaves off as much as possible and it's uh, 
hard to tell whether this, the tree is going to survive or not. It depends on how much of the chemical it's absorbed. But there's not much you can do other than that. This is a common question we get every year. There's bundles of leaves in my yard, and it doesn't look like the leaves or anything's wrong with them. What's causing this? Squirrels. What? Squirrels. That guy? Yep, <laughs> that's him. So the next thing to look at is the tree under stress. And here's some common examples of the tree under stress. The first one is that early August fall color. So, you know, if a tree starts turning color about the 1st of August, you know there's something stressing it out. Uh, is the tree got yellow leaves? This is common with uh, pin oaks. Uh, water sprouts. Water sprouts are a clear example that there's something wrong with the tree. You know, in, the, in the, the trunk of the tree and on the branches, there are dormant buds. And uh, they only become active if the main buds, you know, uh, trees grow by what they call apical dominance, which means that the growth hormones are in the tips of the branches, the, the buds on the tips of the branches. So if you cut those off, it's going to push that horm those, the dominant hormones down into the lower buds on the tree. That's why if you want to make a, a plant bushy, you cut the, the terminal uh, buds off the, off the plant, which causes it to be bushy. So when you see these water sprouts, that means that something's happened in the canopy. Either nutrients aren't getting up to the leaves, or uh, anyway, something has happened to the, that, the leaves in the canopy. So to compensate, these dormant buds along the trunk of the tree all of, a, all of a sudden become active. And it's trying to grow new growth to produce food for itself. Uh, I, I noticed in Cedar Rapids where we've lost from the duration, we've lost, uh, many of the bigger trees have lost major branches. And so last summer, you started seeing these water sprouts coming out. The trees were compensated for, for compensating for the loss of that canopy. So of course, the next, next one is the needles turning brown on a on an uh, evergreen tree, or just die back in the crown. So any of these could be caused by something going wrong in the trunk, where the, the nutrients that the roots are collecting are not getting transported up to the canopy. So things to look for are insect infestation. Again, you're chewing and you're sucking insects. Uh, disease, fungal, bacterial, or trunk or branch injuries. So look, look at, see if you get any holes in the tree. That's a clear sign that you've got a borer problem. Here's some examples of some borer. Of course, the emerald ash borer, uh, the bronze birch borer. For just about every species of tree, an associated borer, species of borer, has evolved along with that tree. And they do have a purpose in nature. When a tree becomes stressed, the borers go in and attack it and do the final coup de grace that takes that tree out of the environment, making room for new trees to grow up. The only thing is the emerald ash borer. He doesn't play fair. He attacks healthy trees, too. So here's some common symptoms of uh, the borer attack. You got the die back in the crown. Um, or you get these water sprouts growing up on the side. Again, it's from the dieback in the crown. So here's some uh, control methods. Try and maintain the healthy vigor of the tree. As long as the tree is healthy and not stressed, bores typically don't attack it. Uh, you can plant disease resistant or uh, bore resistant plants, trees. When you're planting non-native Iowa trees, you know, trees native to Iowa have evolved over millions of years to withstand the really strong conditions that we have here. And trees that aren't native to Iowa just haven't evolved to compensate for the high humidity, drought, flood, all the other things that we have here in Iowa. So if, you're trying, if you do want to plant a non-native tree, try and simulate the conditions as much as possible. I know white uh, birches are a very popular tree to, to plant here, but they don't grow here. They're not native to Iowa. They're native to Canada, Alaska, 
in the northern, northern part of New England. So if you think about what the growing conditions are in those areas, Canada, Alaska, it's cold in, in the summer and it rains most of the time in the summer. So if you're gonna plant a white birch, at least don't plant it on the western side of your house where it's gonna get the direct sun in the afternoon. And try and mulch as much as you can around the, the root system to keep that root system nice and cool and moist during the, the hot summer months. Uh, prune only during the dormant period. I can't stress that too much. An open wound on a tree just invites bugs to come in. Um, you can use a nuclear option, again, these soil drenches injections, and that's what we're using on the uh, ash trees. I've got 10 ash trees on my property, and it costs me about $150 a, a year to use a soil drench, as opposed to I don't know how many thousands it would cost to uh, take those trees down. I will point out, though, if you're going to use the nuclear option, um, make sure it's well away from anybody's garden. Uh, there are no uh, flowering plants within about 15 feet of the tree. Uh, once attacked by borers, there really aren't any remedies. Uh, It might be effective on trees that are less than 30% affected. Okay, these are the sucking insects that attack the, the bark and, and the trunk. The most common one is uh, scale. And it's pretty common on magnolia trees. We usually get a call at least several times during the, the growing season with somebody saying, what's this crusty stuff on the, on the branches of my magnolia tree? I lost a magnolia tree to scale. I, I, I knew I had the problem. I didn't do anything about it. The scale had sucked enough of the juice out of the tree to, to stress it. And then that winter, we got a minus 30, 30 degree winter, and that was just enough to put it over the end and kill the magnolia tree. Anyway, the scale, uh, they don't lay eggs. The, the, the crawlers, that's the, the babies, are born live, and they're born um, in August, and they attach themselves to the branch, and they overwinter there, and then in the next spring, they uh, attach themselves to the bark and start forming these colonies of these hard, crusted uh, scale on the branches. So control, uh, since the crawlers emerge in August, that's the best time to try and kill them. The scale, it's very difficult to kill the scale with any kind of insecticide because that, they have that tough, hard shell that it, and encases them. So the best time to, to kill them is when they're crawlers, and you can use any kind of an insecticide when they first appear in August. Uh, the, the next best uh, time, time to do it then would be in the spring. You can use a dormant spray and that, that's something you put on before the leaves start emerging. And it covers the scale and uh, uh, actually smothers it. So, and then the, the final option is doing the, the nuclear option. You can try and wash, if you have a small tree, you might try and uh, take a scrub brush and some soap and water and try and brush them off as much as you can. Are there areas of dead bark or sunken discolored bark? Uh, that's typically a sign of a canker. Uh, there's a couple of trees that are very susceptible to cankers. I know locust trees are susceptible. Some of the, the fruit trees are. Again, it's from uh, this fungus attacking the tree through an open wound. Again, I can't stress too much. Don't prune except in the dormant time. Uh, once you get a canker, there's not much you can do except try and uh, cut that branch off that's infected. It's a typical problem with some of the pine trees. Talk a little bit about pruning. Um, well, you are master gardeners. You've probably all had the pruning class, so I won't go into too much detail. Except best time to prune during the dormant season. Worst time to prune all other times, and that's the reason why. In the spring, the trees just 
budding out. It's taking all of its energy to, to form uh, new leaves, new growth, and uh, new seeds to, to propagate itself. During the summer, if you get any kind of dry periods, that tree is really going to be under stress. It doesn't need additional stress by doing pruning. In the fall, the tree is trying to button up for winter, and uh, again, it doesn't need any more stress at that time either. Has the trunk been injured? There's some typical problems with trunks. You got more problems, construction, or just carelessness. Somebody has uh, girded that tree up at when it was planted and forgot to take the guide wires off. Are there splits or cracks in the bark? These are some common problems now. It didn't used to be, but uh, sun skull and frost crack. Sun skull, you know, I've been growing trees for 50 years, and I haven't had a problem with sun skull until the last few years. I've lost three trees to sun skull in the last two years. And what causes that is early in the spring, when that's right like right now, that sun is really, really hot. And early in the morning, when it shines on, on a tree, uh, trunk that it's really hot, but that tree is probably still frozen from last night. So anyway, it heats that tree up, and it heats the tree up during the day, and then at night you get cold temperatures again, and it freezes. So that constant thawing and freezing of the bark causes it to expand, and then eventually it just falls off, like in this picture here. And I, I think it's kind of the new weather patterns that we're experiencing. Again, I say the, the, that hot March sun, but we're getting cold days like five degrees, 10 degrees, well into April that I don't think we used to get at all. And then the frost crack, that's typical of some of the larger trees. And the sun skull, you'll usually see that on the east side of the tree because that's that east sun early in the morning hitting the tree. Uh, frost crack, it's usually on bigger trees and it's on the northwest side of the tree and it's caused by the same, same problem. It's that evening sun beating down on that tree and, and uh, expansion of the uh, bark in the, uh, the uh, trap, sap. Uh, and then the far left picture there is the lightning damage. There's not much you can do if a tree's been hit by lightning. So although cute, these are probably some of the most destructive things to trunks and branches on trees. <laughs> Deer, of course, during the rutting season, I, they do eat some trees. That, that's true. Arborvitae is one of their favorite. But the biggest problem I've had with deer is during the rutting season, them uh, rubbing their, their uh, horns on the, uh, the tree and, and taking the, the bark right off of it. And then, of course, rabbits, they can nip a sapling right off. In the winter, if you have a really, really hard winter with a lot of snow cover, they have nothing to eat, they'll start girding the, the uh, smaller trees, the, the bark right off of them. So I found the most effective means is fencing them out. Uh, after two falls of losing most of the trees that I planted to the deer, we put, finally put a five-foot fence in. Now the neighbors in back of us, you can kind of see it at the bottom, had a three-foot fence, and of course the deer jumped right over it. No problem at all. So we put a five-foot chain link, black chain link fence in. Uh, that was the tallest fence that we could put in according to the code in Cedar Rapids at the time. I know a deer can typically jump a, a, a five-foot fence with no problem at all. But you know, deer have kind of poor eyesight. And this is a black chain link fence, and you can see the top of that, that fence is quite a bit ab above the uh, line of sight of that deer. I don't think they can judge how tall that, that fence is, and that's why they've never, we've had the fence in for over 20 years and we've never had a deer jump into the backyard. And then the picture on the right is how to deal with rabbits. So I found some uh, chicken wire that has a black vinyl coating on it so it doesn't rust. And uh, it's three feet wide, so I've stretched an, a foot and a half up the fence and a foot and a half along the ground, just under the, the, the ground, and no problems with rabbits. Now, they can easily go through that mesh in the chain link fence, but they can't get through the uh, uh, chicken wire. And then in the front yard, don't have uh, 
possibility of a fence. So now the, the tree on the left is a uh, Japanese lilac tree. First year I planted it, of course, I put the uh, tubing on the trunk of the tree. And then the following spring, I found where the deer had rubbed all the other branches. And so following years, I've put this on, on the other branches to keep them away. And then the picture on the right is of a tree I just planted this summer. It's a small Korean maple. And I know the deer would just decimate that if they had a chance to. So I took this old obelisk and I put that up. And I'll probably leave that there until the tree gets a good six, seven inches. Uh, deer particularly love to rub on smooth bark trees like maple trees. I think red maple is it has a real smooth bark and that's one of their favorite. Are there mushrooms protruding from the trunk? This is usually a sign of a conch, which is a really serious problem. It could even indicate that you've got a hollow tree. If you see something like this, it's probably a good thing to, to have an arborist come out and look at the tree and see what the problem is. You know, think, you think bringing an arborist out, that's, that's really expensive. Really, they only charge about $100 to come out and diagnose a tree. So that's not too bad, especially if you get a, a tree that can cause damage like this one. Next thing is to examine the roots, and you're looking for soil conditions, injuries, or restrictions. Was the tree planted too deeply? The picture on the left is what a tree should look like with that nice flare. And the picture on the right is one that's either been planted too deeply or it's got girding roots. It looks like a telephone pole sticking up out of the ground. So. That's what happens when you get girdling roots. And that usually is caused by either uh, when, when it was planted, not look, inspecting the roots uh, well enough to make sure that they weren't encircling the root ball, that they were growing out away from the trunk, or it was planted too deeply. So usually when I don't have master gardeners, I go into planting a tree a little bit. But I won't belabor this, since you probably own a hot plant a tree, other than to say that the two most important things are to make sure the hole is wide enough. Remember that tree spent its last winter out in a field somewhere where it had been grown. And when it was dug up, 90% of the roots were left in the field. Only 10% of those roots came with it in the root ball. So that first year that that tree is growing, it's going to be trying to reestablish its roots. In fact, the, the, the rule of thumb is for every inch in diameter the tree is, it takes a year to reestablish the roots. So if you've got a one inch diameter, like that's most trees that you buy in the nursery, it's going to take the first year to reestablish that roots before it's going to start growing. A three inch tree will take three years to reestablish its roots before it starts growing. And I've got proof of that. I planted two autumn blaze maples in the backyard. One was a three inch, one was a one inch. Today, you can't tell which was the larger tree when I planted it. In fact, three, four years after I planted them, they were about the same size. So uh, again, you want to make sure that that hole is wide enough. I rule of thumb is I usually like to make the, the hole as wide as what the drip line of the tree is that I'm planting. And that's kind of shown in the picture here. Mm -hmm. And you want that soil nice and loose so that the roots don't have any restrictions in trying to grow. And it's, uh, if it's loose, it's going to be very porous and there's going to be lots of oxygen in that soil. And that's what the tree needs to reestablish its roots. Uh, I know uh, as far as fertilizer go, I don't think it's necessary to fertilize a tree. I know Earl May would not garn tree trees that they sold unless you bought their plant starter. What that was was a high uh, the, the, the middle phosphorus uh, uh, fertilizer. So the middle number, make sure that's nice and high because that's what's required for growing new roots. Are there signs of physical injury to the roots? You'll see this a lot in older neighborhoods. The other thing you'll see is where they've taken that out, cut that major root off the tree, and, and put in a new sidewalk. Signs of trenching. There are some species that will tolerate some trenching, like silver maples, cottonwoods, you know, some of the more faster growing weed trees. Um, and then there's some that are very sensitive, like oaks. Is there evidence of soil compaction? Soil compaction. 
again, makes may, it, it tamps out the, the air pockets in the soil, so there's less oxygen in the soil for the tree to absorb. Are the roots restricted? Um, I don't know why it is, but we seem to want to make a circle around our trees. <laughs> Change in soil grade. Um, you know, there, uh, oxygen is re required to do photosynthesis, and it, most of the oxygen is in the upper 8 to 12 inches of the soil. So if you put a planter around a tree, like in the, the left picture, or right picture there, that's going to uh, deplete the amount of oxygen that that tree has. Eventually, that tree is going to die. And the reason most people do that is to solve this problem, where you've got a shallow rooted tree. Maples are notorious for this. And uh, they're, they're trying to cover up the, it's impossible to mow around that, and it's pretty unsightly. So it's a way of uh, kind of hiding that. This is a better way, a way to do that. Just put a good mulch around it. It's a lot less expensive. and. Uh, uh, to my way, I think a lot more, uh, more pleasing to the, uh, the eye, and it's a lot healthier for the tree. Have chemicals been applied recently? Um, chemical sprays on your yard probably don't affect most trees, but if you've got a tree that's already under stress, this might be just enough to push it over the edge. So try and avoid any kind of chemical sprays around a stressed tree. Poor drainage. Do, uh, water pool around the the tree. We had a guy call into the Hort line. He had planted three red maple trees in his backyard, and two of them were doing great, and one of them wasn't doing so well. And so we went out to check it out, and it turned out the one that wasn't doing so well was in kind of a low part of his yard, right by the drain spout coming from his garage. And we asked him if water ever pooled in that area, and he says, oh yeah, every time it rains. Well, red maples do not like wet feet, and they do not do well in really wet soils. So that explained why this red maple wasn't doing so good. There have been periods of drought. You know a drought can cause a tree to decline as much as five years after the drought. It stresses the tree that much. This is soil too alkaline. Some trees like pin oaks require a slightly acidic soil in order to absorb certain nutrients. The uh, pin oak uh, has a problem absorbing iron if the soil is too alkaline. And uh, of course, here in the Midwest, we're right on top of a cor what used to be millions of years ago, a coral reef. So there's a bedrock of limestone under our, our soil, which makes it very alkaline here. This is a common question that we get. Uh, why are the uh, conifers turning brown? In the, it's usually in the spring. Now remember, uh, leaves or needles need water in order to do photosynthesis. And since those needles persist on the tree all winter long, they're still performing some kind of photosynthesis. And so if they're not getting enough water in order to do photosynthesis, those needles start to die and they turn brown. And this is another reason why needles might be turning brown. If you get them encrusted with snow during the winter, they can't perform photosynthesis, and that can cause them to die. Why are the needles in my white pine or arborvitae turning brown? Well, most pine trees retain their needles for about five to seven years. Turns out the pine tree only one to two years. So it's very common for a pine tree to lose about a third of its needles every year. Same with the arborvitae. And there are some years where it's a little bit more than, than, than in others, but that's a common thing. So in the summary, as showed you how to take a systematic approach when diagnosing, diagnosing the tree problems. You know, look at the leaves, look at the branches in the trunk, look at the root for any kind of problems. Usually it takes more than one issue uh, to, to compound in order to uh, cause a, a tree to decline and, and die. Again, I can't stress this too much. One, of, one thing that we can do is don't prune unless you absolutely have to during the dormant season. Um, again, maintain healthy trees by uh, minimizing stress factors. You can plant disease-resistant trees. I know there's several crab apples that are disease-resistant. I would say 
in fact, I think most of them on the market now are, are disease resistant. Um, they've reintroduced, several companies have reintroduced elm trees that are resistant to the Dutch elm disease. Um, and I can't stress this too much, plant native trees. They have evolved over millions of years to withstand the harsh conditions that we have here in Iowa. So. Now, everything that's in my presentation comes from the ISU uh, brochures. And I sent Linda uh, some handouts, and in that handout, it's the, okay. That that's got my references. Now, a lot of the pictures that were in this presentation also come right out of those brochures. So, any questions? Yes. Are trees and woody shrubs still dormant now? Yes. You know, I. I before the presentation, I took a gander in, in my backyard to see what was coming out. You know, the ground's still frozen, mm -hmm. and, but everything's still dormant. So when is it safe to... When the st leaves start popping out. Okay. As soon as you start seeing the leaves po popping out, then they're growing, so... Okay. Mike, one of our master gardeners submitted an article to our newsletter about beetle juice for uh, treating Japanese beetles. It's a Bacillus thuringiensis galleria product. I'm and not they claimed it was effective and eliminated beetles on some of their bushes or plants. Is Any it a, a drenched or is it? It's a spray. A it's a spray. Yeah. They okay. purchased it from uh, Gardens Alive or some huh. online. Okay. Source. Anybody else have experience with that? Tyler, you ever hear that? Uh, I've heard of it for other plants and, yeah. and insects, so it might be effective. She claimed it was quite effective, but I, I don't have any experience with it. I, I tell you, there is no rhyme or reason with Japanese beetles. I, I had a <laughs> flat of impatience one year that I planted in my flower beds, and I had a few left over, so I stuck them in a pot and I set the pot on the, on the deck. The, the beetles just came in swarms and attacked the, the plants in, those, in that pot. And I tried all kinds of insecticides and everything else, and they still came in swarms. And they didn't touch the other ones in the flower beds. Huh. Didn't even touch them. I don't know. Personally, I just live with them. If they, <laughs> they eat what they will. Anything else? Well, if not, they, oh. Um, when you were talking about the spruce trees that um, needle drop and using the um, fungicide, you said that would cure it. It doesn't really cure it, does it? It just slows down the progress. Yeah, of, of which? Okay, so I'm talking about um, the spruce trees that get that oh, yeah, yeah. needle drop from a fungicide, fungus. We've got master gardeners that apply it to their trees, and they say it's effective, but it's something you have to do yeah. every year. Yeah, and I think it's still, the ones that are dead are dead though, right? Yeah. I mean, so eventually it's going to go, I think. Yep. We've tried it and we gave up. <laughs> I just was curious. Again, plant native trees, the white spruce is native yeah. to Iowa and it does, it's not as affected as much as that is. So. Okay, well, thank you very much.